Thank you so much, uh, Jenny and, and Franz. It's a, a pleasure to be here to speak to you today. Um, so I'd like to talk about three things today. The first um, point I want to talk about is uh, whether or not individual variation in, uh, across individuals, across children, really matters when we're living in a highly obesogenic environment like the one we live in. Do genes really matter? Is the environment that we live in so palatable uh, with its food choices that it simply overrides our genetic differences? Um, the second uh, point I will make is that um, the food environment is important especially in its context to interact with genetic differences. And I'll talk a little bit about the work that we're doing um, in food cues and sensitivity to food, food cues in children. Finally, I want to mention um, what I think are um, opportunities for collaboration. I'd like this to be, um, well, I'll mention a little bit about the work we're doing um, in this context. I'd like this to really be something we focus on in the panel discussion to really get ideas from the audience. From work that um, Leanne Birch and Tony Sclafani and many other people have done, we have a pretty good idea how food preferences develop in children. Um, we know that these are not innate, although there are innate aspects of food preferences that are impacted by genes. Overwhelmingly, food preferences develop by many other complex phenotypes. There are interactions between genes and the environment. Um, in addition, there are processes by where food preferences are learned. Um, the process of familiarity or mere exposure with food cues can uh, increase food preferences over time. Uh, we know that flavor-flavor learning, where you can pair an unliked flavor, uh, such as broccoli, which is a common vegetable that children don't like, with something that's liked, such as a dip or ketchup, will increase the preference for the unliked vegetable. Um, flavor consequence learning, where you might uh, take in something that doesn't agree with you and you get sick and the next time you um, go to have that food you uh, have an aversion to it. This also works in the other direction too. If we take in something that has calories and we have a positive uh, reinforcement, we, this can actually impact our food preferences in the other direction. Uh, finally, flavor context learning, which um, there are many contexts in which food preferences are learned in today's current environment. Um, in this, we talk about the role of the family, uh, the role of uh, schools, and the role of peers to really influence the context in which children are learning about foods in our environment. If you think about our genes and when they might have developed, they really are um, uh, perfect for recognizing calories in the environment. Um, we developed our genetic differences at a time when food was scarce, and so we're very good at dealing with times of food scarcity. Um, we're very good at recognizing calories in our environment, so because of this, we have innate preferences for things that are sweet. And if you compare our reactions to um, sweet uh, things to reactions of um, hominids, what you see are very similar reactions to things that are sweet, so you have tongue protrusions, um, whereas we have these universal gapes to things that are bitter. Um, in addition, we have a, a reaction such as a smile when infants, even infants that, uh, or neonates or, um, uh, during, during fetal development, we exhibit these uh, reactions to sweet and bitter. Um, in addition, uh, tongue protrusions that are either up or down to, to um, substances that are sweet and bitter. So these are thought to be innate or um, really uh, inborn reactions to sweet and bitter that we have, and they're protective against helping us avoid toxins in our environment and helping us to find sources of carbohydrates or calories in our environment. However, um, the environment that we all live in today is uh, what we call obesogenic, so there are highly palatable foods everywhere. Um, they're very easy to access. We don't have to do a lot of work to access them. So are these genes that we developed at a time of food scarcity uh, working against us now? They probably are. So in the context of this highly obesogenic food environment, what is the role for individual genetic variations in driving some of these early food preference behaviors? Um, we've been looking at genetic variations, in particular genetic differences in the ability to taste bitter compounds for quite a while. And I'll take you through the pathway that um, we think about when we look at these var variations. We 
um, know that there are lots of genetic variations in taste receptors and that these have an influence on our ability to perceive differences in um, uh, foods or beverages that we might come across. But this relationship is not one-to-one -one and can, in fact, be modified by exposure to foods or other substances in our diet. Um, we think that there's a relationship between our uh, ability to taste foods and beverages and our preference for these. But in fact, you probably know people who really like foods because they're very bitter or who really like foods because they're spicy. So again, the relationship here is not one-to-one. -one. Uh, we think that uh, we tend to eat foods that we like, and this might be true in children, um, might be true in children, but uh, in adults, we eat foods for all kinds of reasons, and some of which, if you were in Steve Wood's talk this morning, he mentioned all these non-homeostatic uh, reasons for eating. And then finally, we think there's a relationship between what we eat and um, our diet and our risk for certain diseases. Again, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, and there are many instances um, of genetic variation in response to our, our diet where this relationship is not one-to-one. Um, -one. So you can understand that if you measure something up here and you try to make a correlation with a very complex phenotype, the relationships will be very small and inconsistent and affected by multiple confounders. And that's, uh, in fact, just what we found. I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done looking at children who are sensitive to a compound called PROPE and a related compound called PTC. Both are bitter tasting, very bitter tasting, in fact, to some people. And Linda Bartoshuk has called these people uh, super tasters because they have a more dense array of fungiform papillae or taste buds on the tongue. And if you compare this to people like non-tasters who are insensitive to these bitter compounds, they have differences in not only their ability to taste bitter, but also other taste compounds and potentially other textural compounds in food. Um, it's been hypothesized even uh, fat and potentially risk for obesity, although it's quite controversial. In addition to differences in genetic um, receptors, mainly the TAS2R38 bitter taste receptor, individuals who are non-tasters also have differences potentially in another gene called the Gustin gene. And this particular gene is related to proliferation of taste cells early in development. So not only do you have differences in a bitter taste receptor, but you potentially have differences in um, development of taste cells very early in development, which may result in differences between these two phenotypes. One of the reasons that um, this particular gene genetic variant has been studied quite um, avidly is because of the differences if you look across different geographical reason, regions in the um, percentage of non-tasters that have survived. If you go to certain places in sub-Saharan um, Africa, you'll see that there are virtually no non-tasters. Um, if you compare that to the United States, in which we have about 30%, um, non-tasters, and even some places in India where we have about 40% non-tasters. This uh, suggests a selective pressure that really favors the heterozygote condition. Otherwise, we would assume that this allele would have been um, selected against uh, a long time ago and wouldn't, in fact, exist today. If you look at the literature, and again, this is highly inconsistent um, if you look across studies and the findings are, are very small, but the, the um, the general trends have been to suggest that tasters dislike foods that are highly bitter. So black coffee, uh, broccoli, um, families uh, of the brassica family, vegetables in the brassica family, and um, grapefruit juice. And in addition to that, um, I mentioned that there were differences in taste cell development and potentially the density of taste cells. So um, work from uh, Beverly Tepper and others have reported also differences in perception of fat and differences in liking of fat. And what these, in some studies, are suggested to be are a higher liking among non-tasters for high-fat salad dressings, um, cheeses, butter, and whole milk. In our own studies, we looked at children who were in preschool um, about uh, 10 years ago at this point, and we had them rate preferences using a very simple um, hedonic smiley face scale that you can't see the axis on the bottom. But what we found is that um, children who were between the age of three and four gave higher preferences to um, raw broccoli if they were non-tasters, so insensitive to bitter taste at this time. 
Um, in addition, they also gave higher ratings to American cheese, which has some bitter components, but is also uh, fatty in nature. And we also found um, in uh, girl non-tasters differences in liking of, of whole fat milk. Girl non-tasters gave these um, higher whole fat milk higher ratings than uh, girl tasters. And in a follow-up study, we found differences in reported intake of sweets and, and meats. So uh, children who were tasters actually reported higher intake of donuts and uh, uh, some baked goods and other types of sweet bakery items, whereas non-tasters reported higher intake of uh, more savory, meaty type items. And in addition to that, similar findings were reported by Julia Manella's lab. Um, she uh, genotyped children um, and children who had the PP genotype, the most common genotype reported among taster children, reported higher preferences for sucrose, uh, a higher uh, wantingness to add sugar to cereal, um, and a higher preference for sugar in beverages. But um, one of the, as I told you before at the um, beginning of my talk, one of the problems has been dealing with the multiple confounders. And certainly the food environment is one of the most important confounders in this area. And so in our last study that we just had published, we categorized children's food environments that had come to our lab using a software called uh, geographical information software. And based on this software, we were able to tell how close fruit and vegetable uh, opportunities were, and this was in New York City, so they could conceivably walk to these options, and how close uh, fast food options were. And when we divided children into children who had largely healthy food environments, meaning that fruits and vegetables were um, more easily accessible than fast foods, uh, versus children that had largely unhealthy food environments, we found a much more robust relationship with their genetic taster status. And what we found is that children who were non-tasters and lived in healthy food environments with access to fruits and vegetables actually had uh, higher fruit and vegetable preferences reported in the lab than children who were tasters. And this was a much stronger effect than was genes alone or environment alone. So again, taking these into account together, I think, is probably very important. In addition, we found um, very robust findings with respect to BMI. Uh, non-taster children who lived in unhealthy food environments and had ready access to fast foods and palatable food choices had BMIs that averaged about 1.5 uh, BMI z-scores. So this is the 95th percentile uh, BMI for age. So they're in the obese range. And you can see it's much higher than children who were tasters living in that same environment or um, individuals who were living in healthy food environments. So the interaction is probably um, where uh, things are most interesting and where we've always known that, that uh, food preferences and complex phenotypes are genes and environment. So taking into account both, I think, is very important. One of the interesting questions that Jenny Fisher asked in her laboratory is how this genetic invariant affects learning of food preferences over time. And what she did is she had children come into the lab for seven weeks and she exposed them to uh, broccoli that was plain, broccoli that was served with a regular dip, broccoli that was served with a light dip, and then broccoli served with a sauce. And what she found is that children who were bitter sensitive over time consumed more of the broccoli if it was served with some sort of dip or sauce. But this made no difference to the consumption of children who were bitter insensitive. So this is a very, um, I think, important technique for mothers who might um, have witnessed that children might eat more of certain vegetables if they're served with a sauce, but there might be variation across children and not all children are um, equally affected by this. Although I won't talk too much about it today, we've uh, recently started looking at another gene that is a fatty acid taste receptor called CD36. And there um, is potential um, literature to suggest that fat has, dietary fat has a taste component as well, although the extent to which it affects fat preference behavior is unclear. But one of the um, variants in this gene that we've looked at actually influences the expression of this particular protein on um, taste cells. And what we found is that individuals who have the AAE form of this gene 
uh, meaning that they have decreased expression of the CD36 protein, actually report higher preferences for added fats and salad oils and other types of, um, of foods. We did the same type of testing in children and compared their liking of uh, whole fat milk, which is um, in the, the dark bar, and skim milk, which is in the white bar. And what we found <laughs> is a similar finding in kids in that children who had the AA genotype had um, largely preferred whole milk to skim milk, whereas you can see kids with the other genotype had no preference between the two milks. They rated them both very high. I'm going to spend the rest of the talk to, um, mentioning some of the things we've been looking at in the food environment. And we've been interested in how food brand packaging affects uh, response to food. But we've also been interested in how we might be able to use this to our advantage as public health professionals and researchers to get kids to um, like foods that they may not initially like. Uh, Jenny mentioned this in her introduction, but when we think about the food environment, we can't start thinking about the influence of this early enough. So wonderful work from Julia Manella's lab at Monell has uh, found that there are many, many flavors that are passed through amniotic fluid. <laughs> These flavors are, um, have the potential to influence the baby and developing child's preference uh, for many years to come. And so many of the opportunities to do intervention with mothers actually occur before the child is born. And so I think this is very important. When we think about the food environment, we can't wait until children are at school to start addressing those issues. There has been some work by Tom uh, Robinson's lab in 2007 where they began to look at the impact of um, food brand logos on foods. And in this study, they um, uh, brought children who were preschool age into the lab and they exposed them to foods that either had a McDonald's logo or did not have a McDonald's logo. And what they found was of no surprise that it didn't matter um, if the foods were common McDonald's foods like chicken nuggets and french fries or apples and uh, milk. If they had the McDonald's logo on it, children reported that they liked the foods better. So we started to do some studies in the lab to see if that had anything to do with how much children ate. Um, the first study we did was a pilot study where we exposed children to meals that were either presented with their brand packaging from the store or presented with um, out the brand packaging and, and influences there. We hypothesized that um, all children would be affected by this and would overeat when they saw the familiar brand packaging um, available to them. But what we found actually is that lean children um, ate about 40 calories less when the brand packaging was there, and overweight children ate about 40 calories more. Um, this is just suggestive of a hypothesis that Stanley Schachter had in the 60s, this idea that overweight individuals are more affected by their external environment. And this hypothesis with the use of fMRI has gotten um, additional um, in interest because we are seeing differences between obese and lean children with respect to their um, uh, sensitivity to food cues in the environment. And uh, a couple months ago, this data or this experiment was backed up with fMRI studies. And uh, Amanda Bruce reported that children who were healthy weight um, showed greater activation in areas of the brain that are commonly associated with cogn cognitive control and disinhibition when they saw food ads compared to non-food ads. But overweight children showed no such effect. So in a sense, they, weren't, they didn't have a greater reward, reward reaction to food brands but they did not show the same level of cognitive control and disinhibition. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think are some opportunities to use some of this information to get children to develop healthy eating behaviors early. But what I'll talk about is really um, uh, the beginning of what I, I really want you to start thinking about for our panel discussion, because I know you must uh, have some ideas of your own. One of the things that we've been um, looking at recently is the packaging in which foods are presented. And we did a small pilot study where we had children come to our lab and tell us what their favorite cartoon characters were. And based on their car the characters they identified, we developed packaging for them that would um, be more appealing, what we thought would be more appealing. We also put little stickers in the packages that they could collect 
and um, use for incentives to cash in for prizes at the following week. We tried to mimic all of the types of, um, of uh, things that marketers use to get children to like foods. Our thinking behind this was that vegetables are innately less palatable than high fat and high sugar foods. And so we have to work a little bit harder to get children to like them. So this could be one potential way that might get children over their initial neophobia of these foods. After a seven week intervention where children um, who were in the intervention group got exposure and, and these packages to take home and they got presented with these uh, fruits and vegetables four times during the day, what we found is that um, there was a trend for them to consume more of the fruit and vegetable if they got it in the packaging condition um, during the treatment week. But when we took the packages away, we actually didn't find that they went back to eating no vegetables. We found that they continued to increase their fruit and vegetable consumption. And this is, um, was nice for us to hear because this means that we don't have to continue to use these types of packaging strategies and moms wouldn't have to continue offering these in the home, but that once children are over their initial neophobia, um, they continue to integrate these foods in their diet. In addition, we found a decrease in body weight in children who were in the treatment group uh, with that intervention. It was a small uh, sample of children, so this needs to be repeated in um, a larger study. But it was nice to, to be able to say that this is a potentially a way that we could um, prevent the development of obesity if we start these types of tactics early. So I'm going to um, finish by talking about um, other ways that we can use our knowledge of how food preferences develop in children to uh, really come up with strategies to improve food preferences in this population. So something that has um, little research has been done, but I think is a very important use of, uh, of our knowledge of how food preferences develop is flavor, flavor learning. So the concept that you can use familiar or well-liked spices uh, with vegetables to get children to eat more vegetables. Um, we can use the concept of mere exposure to increase opportunities for children to cook and prepare foods, either with parents or in the context of families. Uh, and can, we can use the context of flavor context learning um, to have children um, really view healthy foods in different environments. For example, presenting vegetables and fruits in fast food meals, or presenting these types of foods at um, parties and at schools, um, instead of always presenting the default high fat, high sugar options. So I'd like to acknowledge the funding we have um, for some of the work that I presented. Um, in addition, uh, just uh, present my uh, lab at Penn State and where we're doing some of our new work uh, uh, now. Thank you very much.